How should we pray to God? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 6. Whew. So we had it. If you've been reading along with me, chapter 5 is a doozy, which is a little bit why I thought about doing this podcast. A lot of times when you do a year in a Bible podcast, 5, 6, and 7, 4, 5, and 6 all get mushed together. and It is so dense. There's no way you can spend time looking at these things when you're doing a 15-minute podcast, mushing three chapters together. So this last one was pretty thick. This next one's going to be thick too. He warns people not to just act righteous in front of other people because the idea is that we're to get our rewards in heaven from God, not to impress people. We're not just going to go out there and say, I'm the most holy of people and you know make this big show about it. The idea is that you're doing anything of holiness, God sees it doesn't matter what you appear, but that means you're doing it all the time. You're not just doing it in front of people. And then he says that when you give to the poor, don't blow a horn about it. You know, don't go through the streets. Did you see how much money I gave everybody? You know, your reward is in heaven. It is not in front of people. So he even says to the point, just give in secret. Don't tell people what you gave. Let me go into the Lord's Prayer. And he said that we shouldn't be hypocrites like the people in the street who stand to be seen. And when you go and pray, you make a big deal about it again. So this is the third one. And, you know, and I've seen people do this too. I've seen people pray against people. Dear God, please let Bob know he's an idiot and he should turn away from his ways. I mean, God did not want us to pray in this manner where we're doing it out loud. And it's not the out loud part that's the problem. It is doing so with, where he says empty phrases. This is what the Gentiles do. Many, many words. You're being all flowery about it. And so instead, God is going to say, here's what you should do in order to pray. Again, the word our, this is a communal prayer. We are saying this together. It's not my father in heaven. It's not your father in heaven. It's ours. It's all of our father. And so then you're saying, holy be your name. His name is above all names. It also means that we respect God when we invoke his name. We don't take his name in vain, which means we don't use it unless we're directly asking God for something. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what he wants is going to happen. And that's where I think, again, when we think about people who are trying to throw logs in the way of Jesus coming, you know, trying to kill the children so that Jesus never comes out, trying to build tombs in front of the golden gate so Jesus could never come back. This is going to happen. His will will be done. His kingdom will come, whatever it is we try to do, and that we're surrendering to his will, meaning we're giving up. So again, that parallel to me then talks about when we're talking of Beatitudes, when we surrender and say, your kingdom come, that we're, we're saying that we're meek. Give us this day our daily bread. So some people say that this is a reference to give us the things we need in order to live, in order to survive on this planet. Other people say, no, 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 this is a point towards his communion, the bread of life, the bread that never makes you hungry again. But a lot of people said, no, that's not correct. John Calvin said that this interpretation makes it seem like God doesn't care about our everyday needs. He only cares about the bread of life in eternity. But I believe that most people go around and say, this is actual bread. This is provisions of life. He cares about exactly what is happening to us on a day-to-day basis. And bread's not just dropping from heaven. We still get bread in the way we get bread. We get bread from working and buying bread. We get bread from charity if we need to do that. But it also means that we should help the poor and make sure that they're fed. Throughout the Bible, we see God includes us as being a part of his miracle. So when we help those in need, we are participating in feeding people who need a miracle to come through to them. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. We know we owe a debt to God, and that's true, and that we wash in baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. And then we pray for God to forgive us our sins. So this kind of parallels in my mind, mercy will be given to those who are merciful. And we ask God to forgive us our debts, to forgive our sins, to forgive us like we forgive other people. And someone 
said that Dallas Willard said, that's a dangerous prayer because do we? Do we forgive other people? And do we want the type of forgiveness we give to other people? Hmm, we probably want better. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So God doesn't lead us into temptation, but it's more of a protect us from temptation. Him to do evil to us. We're not asking him and saying, hey, don't do evil to us. God would never do evil to us, but don't test us. Don't tempt us. Don't let us fall into the hands of evil. Protect us from evil. And then Charles Spurgeon said, this is also looking at that if we pray not to lead us in temptation, and then we just jump right into temptation with our own lives that we do of moral sin, then the words are on our mouth, but we're not doing what it's supposed to do. Then he goes on to say, if you forgive others for their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people for their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. So again, we're calling back again, mercy, forgiveness of debt, now forgiveness of sins. We don't hold anger and bitterness towards people. We don't hold things against them. We forgive them. We let go of it. We're ready to let go of it. Then Jesus goes on to more lessons, fasting. If you're going to fast, don't look downcast. Don't tell everyone about how you're fasting. Look at me, I'm so starving. I am so holy. I'm fasting. Fasting is good. Fasting is a spiritual practice that we should consider doing. But we don't walk around lamenting our fasting to other people because, again, we're doing this as a show. And so that we started out at the beginning parts where he was saying, don't just make things into a show, do things because they're the right things to do. And he's hitting out at the Pharisees again who fasted twice a week. Don't lay up treasures in heaven. If we have a lot of treasures on earth where things destroy it. You know, when you look at people who are like those detectorist people and they go looking for Roman caches, so they would take their money and they would bury them in the ground and go back later and pick it up. If you had clothes, if you had linens, the moss would eat them. Things here on earth are temporary. Everything we build falls apart. Everything that we have will fall apart. We're not taking anything with us. Thieves will steal it. So he said that we shouldn't build all this treasure now. Instead, our treasure will be where our heart is. So if we put all our treasure into money, money will be our heart. If we put all our treasures into our glorious house, that's where our heart will be too. One tornado takes out the house. So it's important that you actually put your treasure where it belongs, which is in the work of heaven, which is the work of the kingdom. It says the eye is a lamp of the body. And so if your eye is a good eye, you'll see the light. But if you have a bad eye, you'll be full of darkness. Light will be in our lives because we're looking for the light and our eye is allowing to see it in a metaphorical way. The whole body then will be filled with light. But if our eyes are bad, we're looking at bad things, we're looking at the darkness, then our body will be dark too. In all of these, you can see Jesus is trying to talk to people in a way they understand. This isn't a science discussion. This is an analogy they get. I think about two people who are addicted to things and they think, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink. And they are so focused on drinking or gambling or whatever they're addicted to, all they can think about is drinking and gambling. The idea is focus on God, your light, your eyes to God, and don't keep looking at this darkness you're trying to get away from. And I think that's where it's saying we should have our full focus on the light. He tells us then that we can't serve two masters because you'll pick one of them. So that's where it talks about the love of money. You can't serve God and money. There's a lot of people who try to follow some sort of a line. It's easy when you live, I think, in a place like the United States because money is everything. You, it's how you pay your bills, it's how you pay taxes, but it's how you give your kids stuff. It's how you go on vacation. But if you love it, you don't serve God because at one point you're going to be held in a place where you're going to have to decide between one or the other. And if you pick money over God, you've lost. I think that these phrases seem like they're disjointed from each other. However, we can see that this is saying, don't be of two eyes looking at light and darkness. And now this one is saying, don't serve two things, light and darkness. Serve one thing. 
He then says, don't be anxious. I love this phrase. And a lot of people do when they hold this one. If they memorize something, they'll memorize this. Whether we're trusting in and not worrying about what happens to us doesn't mean we shouldn't work. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, feed our children or do anything like that. But the question is, are you worrying about it? And should you know that God will care for you? God, again, does care for the things of this earth. We just talked about give us our bread, our daily bread. God cares about the physical being of us. So we should not worry. So therefore, do not be anxious, he says it again, about what you should eat, what should we drink, what should we wear, for the Gentiles seek after these things. The people who aren't believers in these things seek after that. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But we should be looking towards, again, the kingdom of heaven. We're seeking righteousness. And this is what this whole speech has been about. How do we gain righteousness before God? And that's all the things that we should be seeking. (laughs) And then he ends by telling us that basically we're going to have enough worries and every day we don't have to go and start worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow will be worrisome enough. (laughs) Yep, that's probably true. And that ends basically covering Matthew 6 in the scripture. Again, this takes place about a year after Jesus was baptized. This takes place, again, where it took place yesterday. There's some ideas where this is, but it's up on top of a mountain. Again, sort of a reverse amphitheater, so lots of people can sit and listen to God. He was, prob- he was sitting when he said all these things. In the chapter, again, we have Jesus, the crowd, and we have the apostles who are also in the crowd. And the key words in this are the same key words as we learned about before, where it's talking about where the birds are fed and the lilies are dressed in beautiful robes. And then the idea of forgiveness as we forgive other people, we give mercy, we get mercy. If we give forgiveness for our debts, we are forgiven of our debts. And if we forgive others for their trespasses, then we also are forgiven. And in the end, it's God's will that matters the most. Those are the main concepts here. Literary tools, that's a big one. A lot of people think that this is a chiastic verse, which means it's paralleling the Beatitudes. It's going through the structure of saying, here's these things, and then it works its way back and saying, reiterating these things now in prayer as compared to discussion of what you should do. But this is a big literary piece. I'm probably not smart enough to understand it, but essentially the entire piece works together as a cohesive bond. And we get more continuation of people who are doing things in public, where it talks about whether we're giving in public, praying in public, fasting in public, but we're supposed to be doing these things to please God, not to be pleasing other people and making a big show for them. We talked about this on the last episode. Most of the things he's talking about, you can kind of imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees sitting in the background going, Yeah, we get what you meant, Jesus. I know you're talking to us. Some people are saying that Jesus created a new religion. He didn't. He is telling you what the old covenant meant. These are the things you're supposed to be doing. You went off track. You are making these minuscule laws. You're wailing in public because you fasted for a couple of days. You're giving so everybody can see you. He is saying, stop it. This is not the point of scripture. The point of scripture is, please God, and to do things because God will see everything and he will reward us in heaven. Our reward is not supposed to be here among people. As soon as we start trying to get the admiration of other people, going down the wrong way. And so for God, what does he wish for us to do? He wishes us to live a righteous life. He wants us to pray to him and he taught us how to pray in the Lord's prayer. He told us that we will pray for our needs, pray for forgiveness. We will pray to protect us from evil. We will pray so that his kingdom comes. His will will be done, not our will. No one is going to disrupt the will of God. We acknowledge his will is coming here and we want it to come here. This is our goal. What does this say about humans? I think that both this chapter and the last chapter has this message that we got it wrong. The Pharisees got it wrong. The scribes got it wrong. You're doing all these things. You're making these minuscule rules so that you look good, so that you feel like you're not breaking this law and that law, but instead you're breaking it all the time. 
Instead, you should be treating each other in all these ways. Your one hand, you're not going to lay up all your treasures for yourself. You're not going to look at the darkness. You're not going to serve two masters. But then don't be anxious. God knows you, understands you, and so you will have comfort from God. And so what's the central message of the chapter? If you don't know, I'm going through the worksheet like I go through every episode. The central message of this particular chapter is to serve God. You're not serving other people. Do the things that God tells you in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I think that, again, there's two core messages. One is how do we gain salvation? And then the other is how do we live? And so in this particular case, we're learning mostly about how to live. We're learning we should be merciful. We should be forgiving. We shouldn't look for ways to show off. He is telling us to do everything to live in righteousness that God asks us to do. Point 11 is what does God require us to do? He requires for us to give, pray, fast, everything we do for righteousness to him. He is the focus of this. He tells us not to be worried. He tells us not to accumulate great wealth and to have a single focus. We're going to focus our eyes on the lightness and we're not going to serve two masters. Woo! See, we're getting into the meat of things. I don't think that for a while things are going to be this packed full of information. Again, chapter five, six, and seven are deep. And so they require a lot of examination. I think we'll get away from that when we get to chapter eight. But I'm glad you're hanging in there with me. Again, this is why I wanted to go through a slow roll through the Bible so we can investigate things. And I think, too, there's a lot of scripture and teaching here. Talk to your pastor. Talk to the other people in your church so that you can get a better understanding of it. It's interesting how many plaques, how many posters, how many times we say the Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, all of those things. And do we really know what any of them means? I think this is a good deep dive. And if there's any clarification, we should get it from right here because God is, first of all, calling out the people in his past who were doing certain things wrongly and telling us instead, this is how you should live. If we understand five, six, and then coming up next seven, we will know what Jesus wants us to do to live. So what I'll meditate on is how God wants me to pray. Do I pray in this pattern? Do I have any pattern at all? I'm going to give that some thought. The P in ramps is for pray. And so I'm going to pray for other people so that they understand that inner message God is seeking from us, that we're not doing things for outward show, but instead we're doing things to please God. It doesn't matter what other people think. And what I'm going to share is how God loves us, that we shouldn't be anxious about anything. He has our back. He knows what we're going through, and he cares about our daily lives. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I would really appreciate it if you told other people about this podcast. Hopefully, there's people who want a slow roll through the Bible. There are links in the show notes where you can download each of the filled out sheets. I'm not much of a writer, so that's the hardest part for me. I'm good at research. Writing's not my thing. But I filled out a sheet that is available for download for you on this, what is called Notion. And it's sort of like a notebook online. You can go to the individual chapter, find the chapter, and then be able to click on the link, either listen to the podcast right there, go to the blog article, which is also up, but right now is in a bit of a temporary location while my website's getting fixed. And you can download the worksheet. The worksheets are in Word format so you can have them to edit. There are more questions on it than I answer in this podcast. Also in the download section, there's a blank worksheet. So if you want to work through this yourself without my words on it, it's available for you there too. These are tools for us so that we can go through this Bible study and get something out of it. There you have it. Thank you for listening. And then next time we are going to talk about Matthew 7. Matthew 7.